Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today we've got wealth manager turned crypto CEO, Mr. Ian Dawson. Let's jump in. Mr. Ian Dawson, and thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Very good, buddy. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure, our pleasure. So let's uh, jump straight in. Talk to us a little bit about, um, about ZBX and what it is you, you guys are doing over there. Got it, yeah. So we're regulated in Malta, as everybody I hope in Malta knows by now. We're a class four uh, VFA service provider. That gives us the ability to do a hell of a lot of things. Um, how we see ourselves actually is we are kind of like a crypto bank, but we're of course not licensed. As a bank, can't call ourselves a bank. So if you look at the, the crypto world and the traditional f financial world, we can do a hell of a lot of those things in terms of custody, in terms of trading and execution, in, ter in terms of VFA transfers, which are akin to payments, um, and many other different things that come with that. So like listing of tokens, um, payment gateways, um, and market making, and then everything you can ever imagine that will touch the digital world. So we're kind of trying to build a strong bridge between traditional finance and the future, what we believe is going to be everywhere, which is digital finance, crypto, um, and having that gateway into the virtual world. So whether that's NFTs, Metaverse, um, Web3, and on and on and on, whatever comes after that as well. Okay. As I understood, quite interestingly, you use regulation as a, as a USP, right? Yeah, for sure. We, well, we kind of had to because that's where we spent all our money. So it, it's, <laughs> um, it's been very expensive to get to where we are today. We're, we're not the biggest exchange in the world. We know that, we, but we've focused very, very strongly on the fundamentals of the business, the foundation, so the corporate governance, the AML framework, the, the license, the regulation, how we interact with clients um, and banks. And that allows us to open doors that we would have ordinarily not been able to open. And that's got to be a strong point now for ZBX. And it actually really is starting to pay dividend because uh, by focusing on the regulation, for example, we focused very strongly on trying to service MGA clients for crypto in Malta. And, you know, a lot of collaboration with the MGA, discussions with the MFSA, um, and mapping out that entire framework. And what that does is it provides the clarity that a truly professional corporate business would need. And it removes some of that uncertainty. So they go, okay, well, we will engage with you because you're ticking the boxes. Because when you go B2B, those clients have to have on their own end, they have to satisfy their own regulatory requirements, which can include things like counterparty risks, can, you know, who, how do you vet the businesses that you're dealing with, you know, treasury management, all, all these different things. Um, so it opens doors. So it is one of our strongest points for sure. Yeah. So so if I was uh, so if I understood correctly, if I'm uh, um, an entity that's operating in a regulated market and I, I decided to begin um, uh, crypto as a form of payment, um, I, I I'd have very limited choices if I wish to maintain my existing license, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends what you operate within, but in, in terms of the license uh, that ZBX has, so with the onset of Mika, marketing crypto assets, which has, you know, really started to steamroll now, it looks like they're really trying to bring yeah. that in a lot quicker than what anybody anticipated. A year ago, people were saying three to five years, and now people are saying it could be next year. So... Um, ZBX's strategy was within Malt was always because the VFA Act, which was slammed, you've got to be honest, a lot of people were heavily critical of it. But I, I honestly believe, not just saying that because we're in Malta and we've got a Maltese license, it was actually the right strategy. It might not have been implemented perfectly. There's a lot, you know, so nascent, people don't understand it. So, of course, there were difficulties. But the VFA Act was so strong, that's why you know, ZBX moved to Malta, so, or set up in Malta. So that is a forerunner to Mika, and it seems that Mika is broadly based off of the VFA Act, meaning that actually when Mika's enacted, we can effectively just step in. And so all of that pain that, you know, you might have heard in the community about how strict it is and all of these things, well, actually, it was the right strategy. Um, they've done what exactly, almost one-to-one, -one, not... 
I've actually heard that the VFA Act is actually more onerous than Mika. <laughs> so we're kind of like, oh, bring on Mika. But, um, but again, you know, like I said, you know, all of these people you do business with, all of these partners now that BX has, so we, you know, we're, we're part of Fireblocks. We've got chain analysis. We're dealing with Nota Bene. We've got all these payment processes. We have a strong partnership with Ducas Copy Bank out of uh, Switzerland. When I say partnership, obviously, it's not like, you know, we're, we're working together very strongly. Um, those things wouldn't exist without that foundation of the and that kind of clarity of the regulation. Yeah, I mean, to to your point, um, uh, the VFA Act was a was a revolutionary sort of push from the Maltese government, right? And even though the implementation was far from perfect, uh, I can tell myself the the end result was actually was actually a great thing. And what what most um, uh, most people fail to realize is that once you, you cement the right set of best practices, there's only so many you can sort of build on, right? So it's, 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 it's sort of the same thing with like um, uh, ISO 27001 versus SOC 2, right? They're, they're broadly very, very much the same thing. So yeah, I guess, I guess um, uh, pushing after so heavily will, will, um, has, has, has really geared you up from Michael, which uh, I mean, everybody at the moment in sort of mainland Europe is is is, is struggling to figure out what the hell are, they're going to do once that that does happen, right? So, um, I, it would be good for for them to know that there are existing regulated entities which they can rely on to 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 um, uh, sort of um, deal with those uh, needs and requirements. And is it is it um, is it just the or is it also the banking side? Because you mentioned the Maduka's copy. How do they tie into this? Yeah, so what we're... Our concept really is is very simple in the sense of becoming a bridge. Um, connecting the past and the future, you know, traditional, digital. Um, to do that, you know, you cannot deny that the banks are incredibly important in that equation. Everybody complains about banking. Everybody's complained about their own bank, the ability to get a bank account. Everybody knows how difficult that is in Malta. Um, but they still are a pivotal part of, of the economy. And so you can't ignore that. So we decided to you know, embrace it and work strongly with them. Again, because of the regulatory framework that we had, they were willing to consider us. They saw the VFA Act as a, as a legitimate, real you know, legislation. Um, whereas others, they actually didn't. So they, at the time, they ignored other jurisdictions in Europe uh, for, for, for you know, applications to the bank. So what we ended up doing is having this ability at ZBX whereby a client of ZBX can open an account and then through an API bridge with the bank, uh, open a Swiss bank account. And then what we do is through, again, you know, the clever guys at ZBX and the clever guys at Duke's Copy, the tech guys, um, you know, connect that, and all it means is the fiat to crypto element. Uh, the trading is is seamless, instant. Um, the fiat is always held at the Swiss bank, um, and the crypto is always held at ZBX. And that's because Duke's copy, you know, their regulatory framework is not allowing them. Or if it does allow them to hold crypto, they have to have a huge margin requirement. So they prefer to work with you know custodial exchanges. So from a user perspective, you go in and you have this fiat to crypto bridge, you've got your money at the bank and you go, I want to buy crypto, or I want to sell crypto, and it's done instant. So it's T0. I mean, you know, I use ZBX, I use other exchanges, and there are other exchanges whereby it's not T0. They, you know, your payment rails are coming through all these different routes, um, and you might not get it and be able to spend it in your bank account until T plus two, T plus three. So... In that respect, it was you know it was three years ago actually when we started that relationship. It was quite revolutionary. So in the same fashion, those kind of bridges we're now trying to uh, replicate with other licensed DMIs and other banks to, to you know expand this network. Um, and the next layer on top of that would be the AML mapping. So what happens when you do the AML mapping is if you've got like a, an equivalence in kind of regulation you can have a reliance on the AML. So if a client of an EMI wanted to use ZBX solutions and we have this AML framework set up, well, it removes a lot of the friction. So we want to build bridges, but we also want to break down those barriers to entry for people to seamlessly get crypto quick.
Of course, because the, the um, what sort of many people don't realize is that the only money the anti-money laundering requirements for um, the crypto world and for the banking world are very, very um, similar, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're approaching a bank from a from a sort of position of regulation, then it's then it's it makes a lot of sense that they that they um, take you when you didn't go down the Estonian route, for example, right, and spend ten grand to get regulated. Um, as far as I as far as I remember, um, uh, the the uh, VFA class four capital requirements just to keep capital locked up 750 730k yeah. so you have you have to you, you literally have to have almost three quarters of a million dollars locked away just to begin playing which um which is uh okay it's a, it's a, it can be an inhibitor but at the same time it sort of serves as a as a it's a great bs filter right yeah. um uh, which is which is basically like how the banks viewed you when 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 you walked through the door um uh, so, so that makes sense and do you think that that sort of um positioning can be leveraged by industries which have problem building trust with regulators like certain high risk industries for example is there some is there some uh... for sure i mean if you, if you go back to you know you've got, you've got to take yourself back to 2018 there was so much activity in Malta that year, um, in particular at the, the blockchain summit, Malta blockchain summit, now AIBC. And it was insane. And, but you look back now and you realize that 95% of those people are no longer there. And you, you, you know, you have to have this threshold of, of, of kind of protocol or practices or policies. And, you know, you have to make people put their, you know, neck on the line. And that's a one way to kind of prohibit, you know, scams. Bad there was, actors, yeah, just, yeah. Let's just be honest. There was a, a huge amount of scams, people raising money and walking away. And, um, and I think that's now with the regulation, you'll see actually what is probably the thing that's slowing down, you know, regulation all across the world is the perceived threat to, uh, you know, customer protection. I think that's part of what it is. It's, um, and actually it's also... You know, there's a huge amount of pressure on accounting, eh, accounting, advertising standards and stuff like that. So, you know, you're seeing things in that in that in that vein now. So, you know, Crypto.com pulled out of a particular sponsorship deal, but I think that's more likely to do with the fear that actually they might step on toes in certain jurisdictions. Um, mm. Because even though Meek is coming to the fore, there is still this unknown element to what you can and can't do. It's still not, you know. You know, go and play. It's not. We're not that, at that level yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting to see how the how the um, crypto world has evolved. And I mean, to your point, yeah, 2018, everyone and their grandma was trying to launch an ICO, right? And it's it's a sort of uh, same thing at least now and last year. As everyone, everyone's trying to do the, do the same thing with uh, pegs, right? And 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 uh, um, yes, I think regulation helps um, very much with this. I just I just find it kind of interesting how the 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 um, the space um, has evolved so much right from 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 way back from the paper right when sort of this was supposed to be a sort of tech that uh, um replaced the banks and now in reality we're finding that um great ways forward are actually to work with the banks and mm -hmm. and enable the 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 mm -hmm. um, a new world right so if i'm some kind of uh well whether i'm 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 a high risk. Um, I'm an operator in a high risk um, industry, or or not. Um, if I choose to work with a processor that's that's um, uh, created, then ultimately that 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 removes a lot of risk and 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 blame from my end if something does go wrong, right? So it's funny how the how the sort of dynamic um, the dynamic has shifted over the years, right? Yeah, sure. um, uh, so that's that's. That's um, definitely interesting. And is it is it is it just the um, just so we're clear? Um, uh, is it is it just the just crypto payments which you help the companies accept? Do you also help them then convert that crypto into into? Yeah. So yeah, when it comes to enabling crypto payments, the we're currently working on products with MGA clients and partnerships with payment service providers. So 
Fundamentally, what that does is it en enables through you know QR codes or widgets on on the operator's front end um, through the payment service uh, providers technology, which is embedded into ZBX because they don't have the license. We have the license, um, and in the background, we are effectively like a utility. We're like a we're, we're the bank, so we're doing the fiat to crypto. So, if that that particular client wants to hold their crypto, they can hold their crypto. But often, what you find is they want some sort of conversion to fiat because that's how their accounting is set up. They're not, you know, they're not recording their balance sheet in Bitcoin, right? So, um, so that's a really important part behind the scenes, and that's fundamentally where we come in is that ability to do fiat to crypto because of partnerships with banks and EMIs, um, and that is again that fundamental bridge between you know traditional and digital. So that's where I think our sweet spot is. The next stage is somebody like ZBX's, our st strategic outlook is to move into the EMI world as well. So actually uh, attain our own EMI license um, and then even further um, solidify that bridge so that you know it's completely seamless. The ML frameworks are you know completely in line and settlements are always guaranteed and, and T0, and then you have that ability to um, you know, service a much broader economy as well, because you get to the stage where you're not just providing people virtual IBANs, you're actually having a dedicated IBAN for their business in one, in one vein. And in the other vein, um, you have the whole crypto world and crypto solution at your beck and call. Um, and through some sort of AML kind of, uh, you know, mapping as well as tech integrations and APIs, you can have that kind of one-click solution. So, so you could be a client of either the EMI or, or the, the crypto exchange. And if you're at the crypto exchange, you say, okay, I want an IBAN. Okay, click. You know, it, it, we're trying to get to that stage. Or if you're on the EMI level and the EMI is servicing gaming companies and the gaming company says, well, you know what, we, we want to accept crypto now. Okay, click. You know, so it goes both ways. So I think that's the kind of, you know, the future. But, you know, going into that a little bit more, I think the kind of crypto world is moving into the banking world. At the same time, the banking world is moving into the crypto world. So there's this convergence and everything's smashing together. And that's because the future's gonna look very different when it comes to, you know, uh, what we might call in 10 years time, traditional finance, which, cause I, I, I think, you know, crypto will be, you know, when we're old and gray, people will be talking about that as traditional finance, you know? Yeah, maybe so. I never, I never um, thought about it like that. Um, uh, I either, I, I either hope uh, I don't get, I don't get that old to, 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 to see, to see a reality like that, or just crypto evolves a little, a little <laughs> faster than, than um, you'd hope. But um, I think that, that you make, you make some very interesting points, right? The, the, um, too many people are sort of focused on, on, on the possibilities of what crypto could do. If and, and, and if all the stars had to align, basically, but what you're talking about essentially is, is, is a movement which is happening today, right? I mean, banks are looking to crypto as, as, a, as a, um, and a couple of retail banks, um, without any names as a, as a hedge against inflation and as an, as an opportunity to create, uh, an additional, um, uh, revenue stream and, uh, and the, and the crypto bros basically are looking to the banks because they realize without them right so it's, it's so it's kind of like it's so it's so it's so weird to see how how um how we've gotten here but talk to me a little bit about um stable coins like what gaps do you see stable coins filling in uh, in today's market and in the future i i would say it's a very big part of the future so from from our perspective from our understanding, we see that uh, stable coins will fall under uh, existing EMI legislation in, in, in Europe. So, you know, stable coins are electronic money. So it, it makes perfect sense. And then in terms of settlements, obviously stable coins are far more, uh, you know, they're quicker. Um, it's as secure as anything you like. Obviously it's distributed ledger technology. So it's got all of the perks and, and benefits. And obviously it also removes the, the problems of what we've faced with, you know, other cryptos which are more like investments or asset classes they are payment networks but they're in a different vein so you know using bitcoin for example um, integrating bitcoin into the zbx 
gaming merchant payment gateway. Um, we can do it, but actually fundamentally when it comes to the commercial use case, the operator is going to want to have a reflection of their own you know, um, balance sheet. So they're going to want to have Euro if they're in Malta, they're going to want to have uh, USD if they're in, in the States. So this is where stablecoins is a perfect use case because you know it's really quickly enabled, really fast settlement, cheap, and uh, for sure I think that is the, in my personal opinion, the whole world will be operating on crypto in the future. And what I mean by crypto, it will be the digital, you know, crypto representation of, of national currencies, private money. Um, you know, if you go back in time, you know, you go back to when Bretton Woods and all of that sort of stuff, when they removed the gold standard, you go back even further than that, private money was a very regular thing. Um, uh, everybody was issuing money. So it's not that you can't do it, it's just that in our generation, we've been brought up with that stability of the financial system, which we now accept isn't very stable. <laughs> so it is revolutionary. And I do think that that is um, a huge part of the future and we're exactly where ZBX wants to place itself. So, um, you know, we're working with uh, USDC uh, directly. So we're, we're looking to enable uh, EuroC or Euroc, I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure how they pronounce it. Um, USDC, um, we have a partnership with a, a Brazilian stablecoin, BRZ. Um, so we're enabled to go in and out of Brazil, uh, BRL to BRZ. So you imagine there's a, a, a client um, or a customer in Brazil, um, they want to access the ZBX system. They literally deposit BRL within Brazil through the PIX network, which is instantaneous. If you didn't know, it's a really great system in, in, in Brazil. And it's converted immediately to BRZ. And BRZ is then in the ZBX ecosystem. And BRZ is paired against USDT, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Euro through our relationship with Ducas Copy Bank. So then you step back again and you say, well, actually, that's a BRL Euro relationship. And that means cross border, applicable to any number of businesses, iGaming, you know, e commerce, um, anything you can think of. So it's, and then just for a normal individual. So there are plenty of Brazilians in, in Malta that are earning Euro and they might want to send things back to Brazil and we can assist with that. Yeah. And the, and the beauty of it is um, technically you, you, you can make those cross border payments happen in an independent way on, on a public network for very little money and almost instantly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's, that's the dream, right? It's, a, it's, it's, it's definitely an innovation in the right direction. And, and, and when it comes to the concerns about you know, AML and regulation, well, actually the regulatory system is maturing. We can all see that. But on the AML side, um, I, I'm a former Swiss uh, private wealth manager. So I've been involved in a lot of AML you know, reviews and things like that. Um, AML capability of crypto is astonishing. It's actually terrifying. It actually goes way beyond AML. It actually goes into a privacy issue because you, you, you can follow the, you know, what we call follow the dollar through to creation and through every wallet it's ever been through. Obviously, CFI can disrupt that, but um, the AML capabilities are far more advanced than traditional finances today. Yeah, I think that's, that's, I think, one of the biggest misconceptions, right? Like people think that you can use um, a crypto and Bitcoin specifically to sort of hide, hide money and hide, hide your tracks. Like we're talking about an immutable ledger, which will consistently maintain that, that financial trail until the end of time or until that network drops, right? It's somewhat, it's somewhat terrifying. It, it, you know, it is a little bit like, wow, it's a lot. And, you, and that's the kind of discussions you have now is where, how far do you go in your, uh, in your analytics? Because, you know, you have to stop somewhere and hopefully through, um, you know, uh, regulated entities and counterparties, that's how you consolidate that, that, that ecosystem. Well, it's, it's lovely to see a company, um, I think, bridging the gap between the the traditional finance world and um, uh, and the regulated world and as well the descent all in one so thank you so much for your time Ian Cheers, lovely buddy. having you thank you very Cheers. much